The MMA Discussion Podcast brought to you by SportsOfAnarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by our sponsor, SubmissionFC.com. Use the promo code SportsOfAnarchy10 for 10% off your order at SubmissionFC.com for all the best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gear. Also brought to you by our sponsor, MMAProfit.com. Play fantasy MMA for free with the chance to win $100. Follow the link in the description below to sign up. Thank you for joining us, MMA D fans. I'm your host, Nick Peralta, brought to you here with... Chris Shemina, The Return. What's up, dude? Say hi. Thank you very much for having me, guys. We're also brought to you here with our, our host, uh, Chris Powell Yuka. There you go. What's mm-hmm. up, everyone? Got it right. All right. Since there's two Chris, I'm going to go with Chris Shem- 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 Shemina. Oh, my God. Shemina. Shemina. I'm going to go with by, uh, by his nickname, the Katana, throughout the rest of the uh, podcast. Everyone else will address him as such. Such. <laughs> We have an awesome, awesome fight card lined up at the end of this weekend, a Saturday at the uh, Mandalay Bay Event Center going down, UFC 181, two titles on the line. It's a crazy card, December 6th. We have Johnny Hendricks versus Robbie Lawler, the rematch from earlier on this year at UFC 171, I believe, uh, for the welterweight title on the line. The co-main event will have Anthony Showtime Pettis. Finally, defending his title this year against Gilbert Melendez in a lightweight championship title fight. Awesome card we have here. We're gonna review the the rest of the card to say what we think, say what we think is gonna say who we got going, who we think is gonna win. We're also gonna discuss later on after um, our thoughts on this new. Hmm, whether it's a good or bad thing, we have yet to decide until we discuss the uh, the UFC uh, uniform news that broke out a couple days ago. And then we will go with some fan questions to end it off. Mr. Katana, first of all, what do you think of this card? Overall, I think it's one of the strongest cards of the year. Um, I'm really liking it on paper, and hopefully it comes through. I mean, I'm really glad that there has been a, um, a lot of um, injuries going, through, out, going on throughout this year. But so far, not a lot of injuries affecting this card, so that's been great. That has been that good. Has been- uh, Mr. Paul Yuko, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think the card is probably one of the best of the year. I agree with Mr. Katana there. And um, yeah, it has it has a, a bit of everything for everyone. It has two title fights, which is good. It has some knockout power in the main card. And yeah, it just has a good mix of everything. Yeah, I'm very excited for this card. Up to down, definitely they're kicking off the year pay-per-view-wise uh, with a bang. I think this card has a lot of a lot of hitters, as a lot of our fans like to say. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. We'll start off with the bottom of uh, the prelims on Fox Sports 1. There's a uh, women's bantamweight uh, fight with Kel Rocky Pennington versus Ashley Evan Smith. Now, this is Ashley Evan Smith debut, but I'm sure a lot of people have heard of her at this point. This is the woman that actually gave Fallon Fox, a uh, very the notorious uh, transgender fighter, um, her first loss. And if anybody's watched it, it was on Access TV. You can look back, you can look it up and find it on YouTube. Should you uh, want to see it? Ashley Evan Smith is a uh, showed in that fight. She wasn't going to get muscled around. She was actually able to utilize a, a, a great uh, a, her, her tremendous skill of wrestling, putting her on her back uh, many times in the fight, and then found them out and finished her in the third round. Ashley Evan Smith is no joke. Is actually taking um, taking the spot of Holly Holm on this card, which is the one unfortunate loss of this card to take on Raquel Pennington. Rocky Raquel Pennington, you remember off Tough, uh, the Ultimate Fighter last year, eight, season 18 with Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate. I personally see this fight as a, as, as an awesome opportunity for Ashley. Ashley is a great wrestler. She's shown it throughout many of her fights if you've seen them. Raquel Pennington is more of a striker. She's got good hands, good boxing. Uh, sometimes doesn't show up though, and it's been shown. But that doesn't mean that doesn't stop her from getting into uh, getting into a brawl in the middle of the of the cage and getting it done. I personally, I see this. I think Ashley will utilize great wrestling, put her down, win the judge's decision. Mr. Palyuka, who do you have winning this fight? Um, I, it's it's a good fight. I, I mean, when you look at Raquel Pennington's record, it doesn't look pretty. But I mean, three of her losses have come to Katzingano, who's fighting Ronda Rousey for the title. Leslie Smith, who's another tough girl, and she recently lost a split decision at Jessica on Todd, which I actually thought she won that fight. It was very close, but I thought she got the better in that fight. And Ashley Evan Smith, we don't really know a lot about her. She hasn't really been tested by any high-level competition, but we do know she's a really good wrestler, and I think that's where Raquel, that's her weaker point. I think she's going to have to defend the takedowns, and I don't know if she'll be able to, but if she is able to and keeps it standing, 
she'll give Ashley a pretty bad beating, in my opinion, if she's able to keep it on the feet. But I ultimately, I think Ashley should be able to come in and get the takedown and keep the fight on the mat. I think she'll probably walk away with a decision. It could be close. It could go either way. I, I, it's very slightly for me, but I'm going to lean towards Ashley here. Mr. Katana, who you got winning this awesome women's band and weight bout? I am also leaning towards Ashley Evans-Smith, but I don't see this being an easy fight for her. Um, since she's gone pro, she's looked nothing but spectacular. I mean, showing her strength in wrestling against Fallon Fox, which I think will become very useful against uh, Rocky in the fight. But also on her amateur uh, records, on her amateur fight record, I believe, and I even remember this off the top of my head, I think she was the one that lost within five seconds at a tough enough um, event. I think she got knocked out in the first five seconds. So I don't see her really – I see her being smart enough not to mess with Rocky on the feet and just using that superior wrestling and strength and – Hopefully that will take her and route to a UD win. All right. We'll move on to the uh, next uh, fight on the card and the prelims. At light heavyweight, Corey Anderson, the Ultimate Fighter Season 19 winner from earlier this season, um, taking on Justin Jones. Now, Justin Durone, Jones takes this fight on very short notice, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, he can be taken lightly here. Corey Anderson, very short in his career, has shown, though, he is one hell of a finisher. Um, three, three and zero oh here with three finishes. He's uh, now going to face Justin Jones. Jones also undefeated. Who? Um, so this would be a very interesting matchup. Justin Jones making his uh, UFC debut while Corey Anderson gets his first fight out of the way. Now removed from the Ultimate Fighter house. Corey Anderson, one of the most exciting fighters on that season of the Ultimate Fighter. Um, I think that Corey will be able to. Um, Corey is more seasoned though, and he's also started training um, at. at at a better gym, from what I understand, he starts start uh, started uh, splitting his camp up between his original and Frank Yeager's. So that's huge. Uh, I think that that experience, the 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 momentum that he's on, I find him I see him being able to be prepared for this new opponent and being able to put him down. So I say Corey Anderson, maybe TKO round two. Mr. Katana, who do you got winning this fight? Uh, I'm gonna be honest, I really don't know anything about Justin Jones. And I barely know anything about uh, Corey Anderson, just simply from what I've seen on the show and from what I've seen in the finale. So, simply put, I'm going to have to go with just, um, sorry, Justin Jones. I'm going to have to simply go with Corey Anderson because I just know him a lot better. So, I believe I'll finish him within the first two. How oh, dare you. Okay. All right. Chris, what do you got in this fight? Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with, with um, what Mr. Katana said over there. I don't really know much about Justin Jones at all. I really don't know who he is, to be honest. And Corey Anderson, I just know him from the Ultimate Fighter, Beast in 25-8, probably one of the best nicknames in the game. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm going to have to go with Corey Anderson. He is, they, both guys are finishers, we know that. And Corey Anderson does have good grappling. I think he's going to get the job done, probably by TKO somewhere in the first or second round. All right, we'll move on to the next fight, the middleweight fight. We also have a tough, another Type 19 winner in Eddie Gordon, who won the middleweight uh, finale this past uh, summer, I believe, um, for the uh, for tough season t- nineteen. He's going to be taking on another ult- uh, Ultimate Fighter veteran and Josh Salmon. I personally, uh, f- people who should know who Josh Salmon is he's he's very he is a good fighter. Definitely has had a has had a, a decent career thus far before entering the UFC. Came into the UFC, won his first fight against Kevin Casey. Um, has looked really well. He's ten and two. He can finish fights, definitely. He, so he's a dangerous guy. Uh, Corey Anderson, <clears throat> I mean, uh, Eddie Gordon, sorry, um, has uh, another one of the really rare amount of fighters that was on the on the season of, of The Ultimate Fighter with Edgar and Penn and actually looked exciting. He looked like, uh, uh, you know, he didn't care who he had to fight. He got in there. He got dirty. He would he would put it against guys. He's a, he's he's one of those guys that's an aggressive wrestler. Where if he gets you down, he puts you away. Or if he's if he's standing up with you, man, he can find those hands. He's a wild striker for sure. Defeating Diego Lima to win the show, definitely a big win. Um, nine and one or seven and one. I apologize. Mm-hmm. Um, he I, I I can't wait to see this fight. This is probably one of those fights that, um, that's definitely going to steal the show. For me, I got to go with Eddie Gordon going against Josh Salmon. I would say round three TKO. Chris, who you got? Um, I'm going to have to agree with you. I think Eddie Gordon's going to be able to pull it away. I I mean, Josh Salmon, this is a close fight. It's a really weird one, too, because we know about these guys, but we don't know 
like a lot about them. We haven't seen them against high level competition, and they're both pretty good. I mean, I think Josh Salmon will probably have the advantage on the feed, so I think Eddie's going to want to get the takedown. I see this being a kind of wild fight. If it depends which way it goes, it could be really wild. I really, I'm not too sure exactly how it's going to go, but I do see Eddie probably using his wrestling, coming away with a decision win, most likely. Uh, Mr. Katana, who you got? I'm out agree with you both. Um, I, Josh is a man's pretty good uh, all around, but I don't see really ways to offer Eddie Gordon. Like um, Chris said, on the feet, Josh should be able to beat him, but I think Igor is able to get the takedown control from there, go to a UD win. Yeah, Josh Simon's one of those guys. He's like he's good everywhere, but he's not great anywhere, so it, it could be interesting. Yeah, I'm excited about that fight. I, I, I'm, I'm more eager to see it now that I've uh, looked into both of these, so it should be a great fight. Next, the main event of the prelims for Fox Sports 1, it should be interesting. Uriah Faber versus Francisco Rivera. Now, Francisco Rivera is is, is a very good fighter, for sure. I mean, he's very, he's near the top now. Of, of He's getting there, of being ranked, being a, a very viable contender and fighter. Um, Uriah Faber, though, man... I mean, it, it never seems like he's ever slowed down. It just seems like whenever a title's on the line, he can't get it together. No title on the line here, so I'm going to go ahead and stick with Uriah Faber. His wrestling, even his uh, his somewhat improved striking, should be able to uh, keep him safe on the, on the feet long enough for him to secure a takedown, maybe put in a submission in the later rounds, Francisco being a jiu-jitsu black belt. I think uh, Faber will be able to... Uh, you know, he submitted black belts before. I think he'll be able to expose a weakness uh, in, in his very strong game and find the submission in the later rounds, maybe round three. Mr. Katana, who you got? Um, basically, I'm thinking what everyone else is thinking. It's not a title fight, so pretty much right there off the bat, Uriah Faber's going to win this. Uh, Rivera's no joke at all. I mean, I still remember his KO of a... Uh, I forgot what UFC event, but the KO of Roland Delorme, or however you say his last name. Very impressed with that. His striking is on point, so that's something that Eri Faber's going to have to look out for, but that's absolutely nothing that he can't overcome. I see it being the typical Uriah Faber submission, either a guillotine or a rear naked choke. I'd say by round two. Chris, what do you got? Yeah, I'd have to agree with both of you. I'm not going to make the obvious joke about Faber and title fights, but as we know, basically, if Faber's not fighting a guy like Dominic Cruz, Hennon Brower, maybe a TJ Dillashaw, he's going to win the fight. I mean, unless you're the highest level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy, Faber's going to beat you, and he's going to choke you out most likely. And it's going to be by a guillotine or a rare naked choke, and I think he's going to probably pull one of those off against Francisco Rivera, who, by the way, is no slouch. I mean, the guy has tremendous knockout power and he's a really tough guy you can't count him out of anything but i think favor is too good all around and he's gonna get a choke somewhere in round two probably <clears throat> good call i mean and those are the prelims that's what we got i think uh I, I think those are all solid picks definitely especially for all the, all the fights that are on the prelims let's move it to the harder hitters yeah i think we've agreed on anything, everything thus far yeah thus far we got ashley evan smith Corey anderson eddie gordon and uriah Faber. California kid. Let's move on to the main car where we definitely might have some some discussion here. Tony Ferguson versus Abel Trujillo. Oh, what a fight! What a fight between some hitters. I think this is gonna be one hell of a violent fight. I'm more I'm I'm just as excited about this as I was for maybe Lawler and Brown. These are two heavy, violent guys in the lightweight division. Tony Ferguson, El Kukui, coming off uh, or, or has thus far had a good streak going on in the UFC since being removed from uh, season, I believe, 13 of the Ultimate Fighter. Um, has shown to be a very di uh, diverse fighter. He can. Uh, he can submit you. He can knock you out. And when he's trying to knock you out, man, he's putting hard hits on you. Um, but coming off a win against Danny Castillo, I think that um, for me, as well as let me speak on Abel Trujillo, I think Abel Trujillo is is one of these uh, great, hot, up-and-comer guys coming off a very, very great knockout, one of the knockouts of the year against Jamie Varner at UFC 169. Uh, the, uh, also won his last fight against Roger Bowling. He's got a good streak going himself. Definitely earning a pay-per-view here. So for me, I see thus far this is going to be a tough fight for both men. But what I've seen from both guys, I think that uh, El Kukui here has the better striking. I think he has more technical striking. He's He's been able, able when he strikes, he's just trying to knock your head out. 
I don't think that there's as much technique behind his striking as there is behind Tony Ferguson's. So I would say that if, uh, if Tony can fight on the outside, if he can play smart, if he lets Abel try and headhunt maybe a little, uh, you know, get him a little frustrated, fluster him, he'll find some good technical shots. He'll land some combinations together. I think he'll be able to put Abel Chahil away. This is one of those fights where you got a call saying, man, it's hard to see how this would go to the decision. It happens, but I, it's, this is one of those fights where you, it's it's more than less likely. I would got to say uh, El Kakui with a knockout in round three. Mr. Katana, who you got winning this insane lightweight fight? Uh, I'm going to go with Ferguson by a late TKO as well. It all depends if Ferguson, which I believe he's the type, to not get sucked into a battle uh, of raw uh, that, like, for example, Jimmy Barger got into an able trio. Because if that happens, I mean, it could be anyone's punch that lands first uh, for the KO. Because, I mean, I I do really don't see this going to decision at all. Uh, Ferguson, like, he has great wrestling as well. So if he wants to play it smart, strikes on the outside, keeps it clean, picks his shots, possibly takedowns for points and control from there. But I'm still going with a round three TKO. Chris, what do you got? Yeah, this is one of those fights. It's, it's like uh, it's probably my top pick for a fight of the night candidate. I think it has everything to just make fireworks. April Trahil is one of those like scary, just athletic, explosive guys who, if he gets into a dog fight, if Tony Ferguson makes this a dog fight, I don't think it's very good for him. I think April Trahil, even though they both have knockout power, April Trahil is just like he's that big athletic guy who can just put you out at any time. I mean. In his, in his fight with Jamie Varner, he was getting beat up for the most part. And then Jamie Varner made that one mistake that he let Abel Trujillo get that punch off and just him out. And, I mean, Tony Ferguson is known for the same thing. And I think he's a more well-rounded fighter. But I think Abel's going to have to make this just a war to win this fight. He's going to have to just get inside. Use his t- he had, they both have good wrestling, but we see more wrestling out of Abel Trujillo than we have recently out of Tony Ferguson. He's going to just try to use his power, have to get inside, and try to take Tony down and beat him up from the top and just stay on top of him, not let him get anything off, get him against the cage a little bit, just work dirty against him. And for Tony, I think if Tony does get taken down, he, he is very good off his back, but I don't think he wants to stay there because Abel Trio is just a really powerful guy again. He's going to have to keep this fight at range probably, just try to use his kicks, use his long, this long punches and try to keep April away from I I have a weird feeling about this normally I wouldn't think this one would go to decision just because Tony's such a he can submit people he can knock people out Abel can knock anyone out at any time and I just have a weird feeling that this fight's just going to be really odd and it's going to be a crazy fight and I, I feel like it might go to decision I'll take Tony Ferguson but it's a close one definitely a close one I think that as well as you were you were saying that that uh that if there was a time for him to get his grappling off, this is a great fight to to really try and show it against a guy as strong as Abel. Try and you know use good technique, take him down, try and uh, tire him out. And if he goes into those later rounds, that's the best time to really start unloading your best strikes. Um, as far as game planning goes, that's why I think Tony Ferguson should do what Abel should do, as you spoke of. He should definitely try and make it dirty, get in his face, stay short ranged. Uh, try and beat him up on the inside. Try to avoid the ground as long uh, uh, as long or from being on the bottom. Definitely, if he can find his way on top, then for sure he should definitely just be wary of his guard. He fights off his guard fairly well, uh, Ferguson. So, um, if he finds himself there, be careful. For both men, that's what I think that that's what I believe that they should do. For Tony Ferguson, I think that there's just more tools to his uh, dismay here that he can use. And I believe that he will. So I got Tony Ferguson winning. I think we all agree on that one, correct? Yeah. All right. It's crazy. All right. We'll go to the, to the next card. Duffman making a return after two-year hiatus. Coming back. Finally bring, uh, finally uh, healthy. Looking hardy. Looks great and in shape if you haven't seen him this week for fight week. Um, has def- Sounds a lot more uplifted now that he's finally gotten all of his uh, issues with the UFC figured out. He's gotten his injuries figured out. I think he's ready. I think it's just, uh, time for him to come back, uh, make a return. And against Anthony Hamilton, he's definitely got a, a decent opponent. Uh, this will be Anthony Hamilton's third fight, I believe. He's one and one. Um, Anthony Hamilton coming off a win against Juan Potts, I believe, correct? Anybody can correct me? Yeah. Um, a cr- insane heavyweight fight. For anybody that remembers Todd Duffy, 
Uh, he is the owner of the fastest KO in heavyweight in the heavyweight division with seven seconds. He's a dangerous dude. He's an athletic guy. He can, oh man, he can move. Uh, he's got to work on his cardio, I would say. If he has, then he's going to look good in this fight. Anthony Hamilton, very limited on what we've seen from him. Um, is he can't fight with range. He's really good at um, dirty boxing. Other than that, it's hard to really talk about what else he's good at. So with that, I think that the Duff man has a real good chance here. I think he's just got to be able to fight that ring rust. That's probably going to play the biggest factor in his return here. Uh, but I'm not, I, I, th I don't think that's going to count him out. I think Todd Duffy will get the win fairly quickly. I think he'll get it at the beginning of round two. Chris, who you got winning this fight? Yeah, I'm going to have to agree. I think I'm going to pick Todd Duffy here. The guy's just a specimen. He's a huge dude. He's in great shape as always. And he's had two years away from the sport due to uh, um, Parsons Turner syndrome. And that's been his main reason why he's been away. And, and we've seen in the past with the ring rust, he lost to Alistair Overeem in 2010. Then two years later, came back and beat Neil Grove by knockout in 34 seconds. Then he beat Philip DeFries a few months later by knockout to just a two minutes. He spent a total of two and a half minutes in the cage. So, I mean, yeah, he hasn't been in there a while, but I think he'll be back. I don't think Anthony Hamilton's a level of opponent that's going to give Todd Duffy too many problems. And as we know, if Todd Duffy beats you, he's knocking you out. And if he loses, he's probably getting knocked out. But Anthony Hamilton, I don't see him being a guy like Alistair Overeem four years ago, being able to knock Todd Duffy out. I think Duffy's going to have his way with Anthony Hamilton. Probably knock him out somewhere in the first round. Mr. Katana, what about you? What do you got? Uh, this is going to be the first time so far on this podcast that I've disagreed with you guys on the picks. <gasps> uh, I like Todd Duffy, and I definitely, I think this is definitely one of the fights in the card that you can bank on, on there being a finish. I know you can say that about a lot of fights, but I 100% fully believe that there's going to be a finish in this fight. No way it goes the distance, because like... Chris said Duffy's either knocking him out or he's getting knocked out. And I see Anthony Hamilton just bringing that Mike Russo patented hammer fist to do. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, as far as what both men have to do here, Duffy needs to utilize – I think what he should do is utilize some strong wrestling firsthand. His ground and pound is no joke. He can really put the hammer down on people. Um He's, he's very good on top. His wrestling's uh, definitely uh, strong. He's strong in general. He's an athletic freak, the way he looks. He's uh, he slimmed down a little, but that's more so, I think, to, to work on his cardio, which is good because in certain fights that have gone into later rounds, he's looked tired. So with that being said, he, I would hope that he's worked on his cardio. That way he doesn't leave himself susceptible to the knockout in the later rounds. Like in the Mike Russell fight, for example, Anthony Hamilton – Definitely needs to be able to uh, keep his, his hands sharp. He's going to need to maybe look to counter-strike because Todd will look to be the more aggressive fighter, I would, I would assume, here in this fight. So Anthony will need to be able to, to keep his hands sharp and clip him when the time is right. And if he has great wrestling, this is the time to use it. We'll move on to the next fight. Heavyweight as well. Travis Brown versus Brendan Schaub. Now, this is a fight where the odds have it much heavily favored for Travis Brown, and that's more so because he's ranked. Also, because he's he's got a decent um, uh, like as far as his last fight, it was definitely a tough fight. But other than that, he's looked really good. Losing to the interim champ it shouldn't say too much about uh, your skill level thus far. And Brandon Schaub, while has while starting to become one of these veteranized fighters, doesn't seem to have really. I don't think I think this is one of his toughest fights to date for sure, opponent wise. Uh, Travis Brown is one hell of a dude. I mean, he can strike. Like very few can at that division. He's tall. He's rangy. He's very good off uh, off the cage, if anybody remembers. Um, and, man, you can never count that guy out. The guy will look for the finish for, until he gets it, until you put him out for good. So with that being said, I got to go with Travis Brown here. I think Travis will look to uh, stay on the outside. I think he'll look to be, uh, I think he'll look to be smart, technical. I don't think, you know, especially with a guy like Brendan Schaub, who's also very technical in some aspects uh, on the feet, you got to look out for that. So I think Travis will also do. I think this will be a slow starter kind of fight, and then it'll pick up around the middle round so or amount around the middle round, the second round. We'll go with Travis Brown. I actually got him by TKO. I think he'll find his way to the ground. I think he'll be able to finish him on the ground here. Chris, who do you got winning? All right. Um, 
just speaking on Travis Brown, I, he's one of the most dangerous guys in the first round in the heavyweight division. He's a guy <laughs> who just throws wild, crazy stuff. He, he's so long, and he's a huge guy. He just throws, like, crazy front kicks all the time, like he did Alistair over He threw, like, four in a row. Throw Superman punches off the cage, as you spoke about. And, I mean, yeah, this guy is dangerous to anyone, but I think he's a little one, a uh, little bit not so well-rounded. I mean, his takedown, he's not really a grappler at all. I mean, he can get taken down, as we saw in the Fabricio we're doing fight. He was, yeah, he's susceptible to the takedown. And Brendan Schaub, even though a lot of people would pick Travis Brown here with good reason, I mean, Brendan Schaub's an overall, overall he's a good hitter all around. He's a guy who can, he can get inside. He's a good boxer. If you can get inside Travis Brown, he can do some damage from there. He's also a good grappler. I mean, the guy has good submissions. He has some power also. He could, he, if he could take Travis Brown down, he can give him some problems. But it's basically, and obviously he doesn't want to do that against the cage because we all know about Travis Brown's elbows to people against the cage. And I think he's smart enough not to do that. And if he's able to find the takedown somewhere in the middle of the octagon, where the cage won't play into factor. I think he does have a shot here. I don't think a lot of people will give him a chance, but I do think he has a shot. He was getting on a little bit of a roll when he, he beat LeVar Johnson. He basically just GSP'd him. Uh, he, beat, <laughs> he beat Matt, Matt Mitrion pretty easily with the, I believe, a Darsh choke he choked him out with. And then the Arlovsky fight he lost a split decision, but I'm pretty sure like about 95% of people thought he won that fight. He was getting on a bit of a roll, and I mean, the UFC probably agrees they're giving him the number three ranked guy in the world for a reason. And I do think he has a shot. I mean, everyone's counting him out, but I, I will give Brendan Chubb a shot. I'm pretty torn on this. I'm like, it's very close, but I think I'm just going to have to say I'll give it to Travis Brown. I don't know how it's going to go, but I'm just going to play it safe. I'll, I'll make my pick Travis Brown, but I wouldn't be surprised if Brendan Chubb wins this one. All right, Mr. Katana. Oh, you spoke on this, correct? Oh, no. I nope, have... go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I just don't see what Brendan Chubb has to offer Travis Brown. And as far as Travis Brown's takedown defense, in the UFC, I believe uh, Verdum is the only one to really take him down and um, that was after the broken ribs and getting pieced up on the striking. But his takedown defense is overall really good. Uh, as far as striking goes, I think Schaub's the cleaner striker. But I just as far as he has to get into that range, and he's very susceptible to those overhand rights. With Travis Brown packs a really powerful one. So I just I don't see what uh, Schaub has to offer. I said there were a couple fights where you could promise to see a finish. This is the other one. I have Travis Brown by round one KO. Um, honestly, I don't even see this going past a half a round. So within the first wow. two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think. God damn it, Mr. Katana. Yeah, I think Verdum just showed a bit of weakness in Travis Brown takedown defense. Verdum's more of a guy, and he's, he's a great jujitsu guy, but he's more of a guy who likes to jump guard a lot. He. Didn't do that against Travis Brown. He seemed to have no problem taking him down. I know he hurt his rib, but it didn't seem like he was having the most trouble taking him down. I think Brendan Schaub's a better wrestler than Fabricio Werdum is, and if he, he might be able to take Brown down, I wouldn't be surprised by it. I'm very curious to see where that goes if he does take him down, too, because I'd, I'd really like to see Travis a little bit more tested on his back, but yeah, I think yeah. Shaw needs to break that range, and I just yeah, I don't yeah. see that happening. That's, that's something that's going to come into play. I mean... Travis Brown, he's, I mean, if he's able to, I don't think Travis Brown's going to be that great off his back because he really hasn't had to work much from there. And he, obviously, in the Werdum fight, he wasn't that great off his back. And Schaub's not a bad grappler at all. He has good submissions, so that could come into play. And also Remember uh, LeVar Johnson's submission defense yeah. against Trump? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. He pretty much just muscled his way to defend the, t the chokes. But um, <laughs> what I'm going to have to say that might be, come into play in this fight don't take this this had nothing to do with travis brown's skill level or anything like that he is training with edmund Parverdian, and that's as people may know he's ronda rousey striking coach and there are rumors that he likes to take people for and like build them up from scratch and basically just rid whatever habits they have and that hasn't worked very well for everyone but ronda rousey and that ronda didn't have a striking background so it worked for her but if he's trying to do that with Travis Brown, I don't know if that's going to be playing to Travis's benefit, as we've seen with people like Jake Shields. I mean, not Jake Shields, Jake Ellenberger, my fault. Um, he's basically just 
took away everything they know about striking and tries to make them into something that they're not. And if he does that with Travis Brown, I don't know. That could be dangerous. I think we should leave it. I think what, what Brown should do, if that's the case, I think Brown should be able to leave it up to the discretion of himself and maybe some his head coach. To be, and I don't know if Edward uh, Edward is his head coach, but he should be able to, to know that you know that he has tools in this fight over Brendan, and that includes his reach. He should be able to know that, and that and that's with his legs as well. He should not, you know, I don't I don't know. It's hard to really think only because I haven't seen Ellenberger's fights as, as any different thus far in his game, other than maybe his lack of of uh, evolution. I would say, but that's just my opinion. Um, I would think that he'd be able to be smart enough to see what tools he has that are, that can be effective against a guy like Shaw, especially with uh, if you look at the Ben Rothwell Brendan Shaw fight. I mean, uh, Ben Rothwell was able to keep himself uh, at uh, fine angles and was and had the longer reach. And sure enough, look what that look what that got him. They yeah, got him a knockout. Ben huh? Rothwell got rocked in that fight. He almost finished. Brendan True deal. Shaw. You know, for sure. Got, I mean, Brendan Shaw got sloppy in that it kind of just rushed in for the finish and got caught. He did catch him with that spinning elbow and had. He had Rothwell hurt bad. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I mean, Shop is dangerous. Let's not let's not be kidding around. While we may while it may be hard to take Shop seriously in this fight, mainly because of where they're both at in the division, Shop is definitely dangerous, especially because this is a heavyweight fight. Anything can happen more so in this division than anywhere else. You know what I mean? With that being <clears throat> with that being said, uh, you know. I, I think that in the Verdum fight, I think Verdum worked on wrestling. I think that's just more of an advancement of skill on his part. And that's why he was able to work the wrestling against Travis. But that's just on another, you know, um, who knows, you know, whatever, you know. I think that more than anything, what Schraub needs to be able to do is work offensive submissions uh, if he finds himself on top or even if he finds himself on the bottom, which is very unlikely, but it could happen. You never know. Um, cause Travis Brown himself isn't a guy who shies away from looking for the submission. If it's there on the ground, he submitted some guys in the UFC before and, uh, you never know. You can see him do that. So with that being said, I just think that Brown has all the skills. He has more skills, um, to be able to, to be able to find the win here. And so with that, I think, I think, uh, Brown gets the win TKO round two, my call. We already got our calls in. So, but man, definitely it's going to be one of those fights where it's going to be hard to really see a finish happening or not happening in this fight. We'll move on to the co-main event of the evening. Oh, my God. I'm excited mostly for this fight than any other fight on the card next to the main event. Um, the UFC lightweight championship is on the line. Anthony Showtime Pettis versus Gilbert Melendez. Um, I did a breakdown piece on this, so I'll just kind of go off what I said because I, I still think it holds merit. Anthony Pettis, um, guy is guy is an insane striker. They call him Showtime for a reason. The guy pulls off Wiley e. Coyote stuff all day in the cage. He'll throw whatever he wants to, and he feels comfortable doing that because he also has one wicked submission game off of his back. He's always attacking. He's always uh, looking for any submission or, or looking to get off his back. He's very offensive no matter where he's at. He's dangerous. He's a finisher, proven 82% finishing rate. The guy can do so many wild things, and because of the fact that he, he goes in there with a sense of fearlessness, I feel, to where wherever he's at, he's going to feel comfortable. And that's a very kind. Of, that's a very very dangerous fighter, and that that leaves Gilbert with the with a bit of a conundrum here, especially in the striking department. Gilbert, he's not a bad striker, but he's more of a boxer to me. I mean, he doesn't throw uh, as many you know kicks as he should. He doesn't mix up the combinations as well as I think Pettis can. Uh, he's not as fast as Pettis on the feet. He's one thing that uh, I think if you look at the weapons that Gilbert Melendez has over Pettis in this fight. Gilbert has cardio, and he's got um, he's got toughness. His chin has been proven to, to to withstand much. Oh, also wrestling, he can wrestle, and I think all of us know that that's definitely a tool that Gilbert is going to look to utilize in this fight for sure. He has to. He has to be able to look offensive from somewhere, and I don't think it's going to be standing up. I mean, he'll 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 use his boxing to set up takedowns or to push him against the cage and fight dirty with dirty boxing clinch fighting. He may look to, to, to find some advantage there. Other okay. than that, it's really tough to find where he's going to be able to find an advantage in this fight. So with that, I think that Pettis will be able will be able to find the finish. And that's saying something, too. Neither of these men have been finished. This is going to be one insane fight, and who knows. Barring a 1KO, though, I see Pettis being able to finish this fight on the feet 
or on the ground. I think uh, Pettis will get the third round knockout, though. Chris, who do you got in yeah, this fight? Like you said, none, neither of these guys have been finished. It would make this really interesting because, as we know, Anthony Pettis in the first round is one of the most dangerous fighters in the UFC, period. The guy has some ridiculous kicks. you got to watch to the body, to the head. And, I mean, basically, every time we see a Pettis knockout, it's with one of those kicks. We saw him knock out Joe Lozon with a head kick. We saw him knock out Cowboy Cerrone with the body kick. Yeah, he's a dangerous guy, especially in that first round because he throws a lot of, like, wild but technical strikes, as we've seen with the Showtime kick and everything like that. He's just a guy that you want to you want to make it a dirty fight against him. You have to do kind of what Ben Henderson was trying to do in their first fight. and I mean, not their first fight, their second fight, excuse me. Um, you basically want to get him against the cage, work some dirty boxing in the clinch and get in close with him. And you want to try to take him down, but the hard thing about that is Pettis has improved his takedown defense a lot since working with uh, Ben Askren at Rufus Sport. And he's been hard to take down. Ben Henderson did have some trouble taking him down and keeping him down. So it's hard. You just want to wear him out. You want to work him against the cage. And Gilbert's known for that dirty style of fighting, but I think Pettis is a little too technical, and I think he'll be able to land some of those kicks. I'm not sure if he'll be able to get the finish, but I think he'll get the... And he's also good off his back, so if Gil does get the takedown, he has to worry about Pettis just constantly working for submissions, and he might just kind of have to get out of there if he winds up Pettis' guard. So I think that gives Pettis an advantage, especially in the early rounds where he can still throw wild like techniques that he's used to throwing. In the later rounds, it's going to be harder for him to throw stuff like that, so I think that's where Gil has the advantage also because he has... A lot more fights that have gone the distance, have gone five rounds. He he has more experience in that realm. So, I mean, I'm going to give it to Pettis. I think it's very possible. I wouldn't be surprised if Pettis finds knockout early. But it also it could go to decision. I think Pettis wins either way. I'm going to say I'm going to have to go with Pettis. All right, uh, Chris. Mr. Katana, what do you got? Uh, I'm going to have to actually disagree for both. Uh, oh! Huh. Again. Again. I'm going to have to give a shout-out to the lo other half of uh, Penermana. <laughs> pick for Melendez. Um, this isn't going to be easy. I'm not, I'm not going to say that right now. But I think Melendez, being the fighter he is, like you said, he's going to do what Ben Henderson did. He's going to lay out that blueprint, but I think he's going to be a lot more successful. He's going to make it a dirty fight. It is going to be hard to take him down, but I see him just wearing him down throughout the first two. Being smart enough to maybe go for a takedown or two, but not fully, fully, fully commit. Uh, wearing him down with uh, just leaning up against the cage, making him work. Rounds three, four, five should be a little easier to get those takedowns off. He does need to mind Pettis' really explosive uh, submission game. You saw that against Ben Henderson. I mean, just down and a snap of a finger, just like that. It's got the arm bar locked up and... Ben Henderson can't fight off that submission um, attack, then I, I don't know how well it would go against Melendez, but I see Melendez really making it a dirty fight. Honestly, might not be the greatest fight for fans to watch, but I think he will make it a dirty fight to where he will take a unanimous decision to go, all the, to go the distance and just uh, walk away the champion. I think you're going to be disappointed, Mr. Katana. I don't know about you. Uh, I would but... be surprised if I was. I'm just... Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. Just <laughs> for anybody that doesn't remember Pinamana, that's Jonas Pinamon from, or I don't know if I said his last name right, from, but um, from uh, our admin Jonas, as you know him, and Shamana. That's Chris, Chris's last name here, the Katana. Yep. So they like to mix their names up. We all do that. It's fun. We'll start edging that out more and more as we go along with these podcasts. As I was saying before, through my breakdown, if anybody's read it, go please read it if you haven't. Um, it's it's definitely it, the odds are stacked against Gilbert here. I just don't see him having the weapons. He's a tough dude, and the fact that he's been in and, and here's a here's a here's why I believe his cardio is better than Anthony Pettis. Uh, Gilbert has been in seven five round fi uh, five round fights and went the distance through six of them. So I just believe that he will be able to hang in there in the later rounds and be able to to really if he can push an aggressive pace, stay sharp. Stay defensive, not get hit too much, not get hit where it counts for Pettis, and and, and and tire him out. Maybe use some wrestling, stay out of his guard. He's got a real significant. He's got a real good chance then of winning that gold for sure. I just see Pettis being prepared for that. So with that being said, 
Two against one, Mr. Katana. So suck it. Yeah. We're gonna move on. <laughs> we move on to the main event of the evening. Oh, the rematch between Johnny Hendricks and Robbie Lawler. Now, this is a fight I could not have waited longer for. Uh, I know it happened this year, but man, I was I was excited for it the second that the, that that the last fight ended. The last fight was so great. I couldn't have waited for the uh, for the next one. I'm glad Robbie Lawler got right back in there and earned that shot. Definitely has had one hell of a year despite the loss starting it off. Um, I think Robbie Lawler has a significant chance in this one. I got to see. I, I say that because I would believe that Lawler, if, especially if you watch this training throughout fight week, um, that he's he's really prepared his wrestling. He knows that if he can that if if he can stop the wrestling, if he can defend that. Because he's got a chance. Because on the feet, this is anybody's game. They're both devastating strikers. They both got hands. And Robbie Lawler's got more of a diverse striking because he uses his feet as well. He uses his knees. He's probably the definitely the more uh, uh, mixed striker. He can not get head knockouts, knees to the face. He does. He throws them all. Um, I definitely got to say though that Johnny Hendricks is wrestling. I don't know if it's good enough if he has worked on his wrestling to fight off Hendricks's wrestling. Hendricks is a heavy, strong, powerful guy. Um, he's going to be able, if he's I see Hendricks being able to put him on his back for the, I think he's going to start the fight off that way. This is what I think Hendricks should do. Is Hendricks should take the fight to the ground. Tire him out, wrestle him, pound, ground and pound, try and look for the finish, maybe even a submission. Who knows? It's what he's been working for um, in his training. As uh, Mr. Katana has pointed out, um, I think that uh, if he can find the, uh, if he could take it on the ground, he can tire him out. If it's if it makes it to the later rounds, that's the time right then and there to really start utilizing his speed to try and get him get on the inside, find his punches. And, and and really just you know it, if he can tire him out to a certain extent I'm not I don't know the, the extent of which Robbie Lawler's cardio is I, I would assume it's really good considering the, the Matt Brown fight but you got to also uh, assume Hendricks's cardio is ready he's been in two five round fights as well as already now and you got to you got to expect him to be ready so with that I think that he finds the striking in, in the later rounds gets a late finish or just the decision again so I got to go with Hendricks here by one of those two methods. It's really hard to pick. Mr. Katana, who do you got in this fight? Um, my heart is with Hendricks. Oh, actually, I take that back. I do like both fighters, but my heart's with Lawler. I would really love to see him win just simply for the fact that if we take this back three, four years, this is something we wouldn't be talking about as far as Robbie Lawler being in the UFC or Robbie Lawler being uh, fighting for a UFC belt. Mm -hmm. But him and Matt Brown, I mean, really turned it around in about 2012, 2013, just really turned a corner and shine. I'd really love to see him get the belt, but I see Johnny Hendricks just being a superior fighter overall. Um, I think Hendricks' chin is amazing, so I think he can deal with the striking. Same thing goes for Lawler's chin. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to be going with something that's probably not that popular, but watching the Countdown show and seeing Hendricks' coach... Um, talk with him about during training and things like that it seems like their game plan is going to be wrestling and groundwork which is pretty smart i mean they talked about the jock ray fight so i'm going to go with a late submission by johnny hendrix wow wow well that's pretty that's ballsy it's on now i roll tell you roll <laughs> chris who do you got right. as much as i would love to say robbie Lawler's going to win this fight i can't i mean and Robbie Lawl is a tough dude. He's one of those guys who you don't want to get hit by. You don't want to get hit by him or Hendricks. These guys land one shot. They can knock you out. I think Lawler is the more well-rounded striker. He lands a lot of head kicks. He lands everything. He has a range against Hendricks. But as we know in their first fight, Johnny Hendricks, even though Lawler did have some success defending the takedown, Hendricks tore his bicep, and he wasn't really able to stick to his game plan. Obviously, he didn't want to go in there and strike with Robbie Lawler. He wanted to take him down. So I think if Hendricks is going to be able to find the takedown, he should be able to just because of his high pedigree of wrestling. He's going to be able to take Lawler down pretty significantly, keep the fight on the mat where he wants it, and just work from there. And I think for most of the fight, that's where it's going to take place. I don't think it's going to be the most fun fight. As it's time, it'll have its moments if Lawler's able to defend a little bit and just work his striking and 
that could be fun like it was in their first fight, but I think it's going to go to another decision. I think it's going to be a little bit more clear cut here. Hendrick should be able to get the takedowns that he wants, and I think he'll pick up a unanimous decision and make himself the clear champion. All right. Those, that's our calls, here, folks, for the UFC 181 card going on this Saturday. It is on pay-per-view. It is probably one of the best pay-per-views of the, of the year on paper for sure. Um, and they're capping, they're capping the pay-per-views off with a, with a nice bang. I think this card is definitely solid. And one, one more thing I'll add is that I would personally love to see Lawler win just so I can see a trilogy fight between these two. I think that the fight will, no matter what, be exciting, explosive. Because both guys just don't know how not to be, you know, in, in all honesty. I mean, I can't think of many fights where these guys had a boring fight, you know what I mean? With that being said, I think this is going to be a great fight. With that, we'll move on to our next subject. We're going to talk about now uh, some news that broke out this the, or earlier on this weekend, or this weekend, this week, where the UFC and Reebok announced a partnership where they will now be in, in, installing and effective in July of International Fight Week next year in 2015 uh, UFC uniforms for fighters. Now, off the uh, off the immediate reaction, a lot of fighters didn't. Well, when the rumor hit earlier this year that there might be that, a lot of fighters didn't like it. the 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 deal with the deal has to do with basically discontinuing any sponsors during during fight week and in the cage. Um, while fighters can still be sponsored outside of uh, fight week and and, and during uh, during their camps, during any other time outside of the cage and away from fight week, they're allowed to still be sponsored for sure. But what that does generally is it, it sucks for many sponsors as well that want to be you know sponsoring a fighter in the UFC because um, that the really the best time to really to really show off your sponsor for anybody that's sponsored is in the cage when you're fighting. Sometimes the people take a peek of your shorts and they go, oh, they're sponsored by this guy or, or this, that, or the other. And that takes away from that. And who this hurts, if, of course, is the sponsors. It hurts some coaches because some fighters are sponsored by their coach's uh, camp. Uh, and it hurts um, – it hurts – well, I mean I guess that's all that it hurts. But in some aspects, it hurts the fighters for some, definitely. Because if certain fighters are are, um, are sponsored by a certain uh, – just one or the other, then losing them might might make a big impact d despite the, the set regular amount of money that they'll get from being sponsored by Reebok and UFC. Chris, you made a great point um, at, at one point about Demetrius Johnson. Please, uh, please speak about that. Or, or uh, that was Mr. Katana, correct? Yeah, I... I that was I, you. Okay, you go yeah. ahead. Mr. Katana, please speak I mean, on that. Chris, but yeah, I made a point about Jimmy Juice Johnson, which is he, his sponsor is Microsoft, which, you know, of course, Xbox is not short. It's still Microsoft in the end. And uh, I feel like it's more so a point of that's really the only sponsor he needs. I might not know the details. I'm just spitballing here. But maybe even they, they just want their name on him, so they're paying him a pretty nice amount to only have them featured on his shorts. That's an awful lot of money because, I mean, holy hell, Microsoft's a billion-dollar company. I don't see him making, like, enough peanuts. So that's a pretty good amount. And for him to possibly lose that, I mean, because Microsoft, if you look at any business, the way I want to sponsor someone when I can't get my TV time, my pay-per-view time, what have you, I'm going to get tweets, Instagram posts, Facebook posts. That's really about it. So... Things like that can really, really hurt these fighters, and I just, I'm going to take a wait-and-see approach, but as for right now, I'm not seeing a lot of positive, more so negative. Chris, Chris what is your opinion on, on everything going on in those parts? All right, so obviously we don't know everything. Where it's kind of, we're going to have to take a wait-and-see approach with this. Just to see how the fighters feel about it when things go through, because we don't know exactly how much money they're making. And what we do know is that there's going to be a tiered system, so champions are probably going to make the most money off this. Guys, maybe one through five, one through ten, whatever, are going to make the next most amount of money, and then so on and so forth. But I think that's a little unfair, just because one, the media makes the rankings, so I, I don't think that should base someone's livelihood off that. And I, I think it could work out. It could be beneficial to guys at the bottom and guys at the top. The guys at the top are going to be making the most money. Guys at the bottom won't have to scrounge 
drown for sponsors anymore. Like, we've seen plenty of people can't find sponsors. So maybe this does help them. But then there's the guys in the middle that are maybe, like, in the top 20, 25 that they're just guys who they they make good money off their sponsors. Because, I mean, if you're on TV with, say, the UFC on Fox or Fox Sports 1 or whatever, you're on a Fox Sports prelim, which most of these guys in that, like, 20, 25 range are on, they're getting viewed by maybe a million people, just a little bit less. And if you're smart enough to go to a to go to a company and be like, "All right, I'm getting viewed by more than the people who are getting are in the pay per view," so like guys have done that before. I mean, I've heard on an interview with uh, Luke Barnett, for example, he's one of those guys who's probably like somewhere in the top thirty of his division. Maybe he just lost, so he might have fell back a little bit. But he was coming up. He was on the prelim a lot of the time. And he said he made a, a good amount of money just because he realized that he's getting viewed by this many people. And he went to a company outside of your typical sponsors and got them to sponsor him. Which And he got paid a decent amount of money. So what about guys like him who are smart enough to realize that, that they're getting viewed by so many people now? They can't go outside of that. And they, can't, they don't have the chance to, uh, I guess, choose their own fate of how they make their money and that they can make more money through that instead of basically now they're stuck wherever they're ranked. That's how much money they're going to make. They don't really have a say in how much they're going to be making, which kind of sucks. And it also, like you were saying, it sucks. It could put a lot of MMA apparel out of business or just really hurt them because now they can't sponsor the UFC guys. But in another way, it does help people like Bellator and World Series of Fighting because people that still want to sponsor MMA fighters, now they can just easily go over there and obviously, Bellator does have a lot of eyes on it, so that's not really any harm. They can go, even though it's not the UFC, which might hurt a lot of these companies, they get to go over to Bellator World Series of Fighting, and it also helps those fighters make some money and have more sponsors now, now that they're not only looking at the UFC. And um, Nick Newell recently tweeted, he's World Series of Fighting, uh, most people know him for having uh, one arm. He is one of the biggest draws outside of the UFC, so he's like, all right, basically anyone the UFC, now all the sponsors the UFC have basically thrown out the window, come to me, I'm one of the biggest draws outside of World Series of Fighting, I'm open to anyone. So it could help a lot of guys like that, so that's a that's a good thing about it, but we really, I think we have to take a wait-and-see approach, just see what the fighters say, because that's basically who it's for, it's for the fighters. So we have to take a wait and see approach. Maybe a year from now, we'll know a lot more about it. If fighters come out expressing their opinions, if they think it's good, think it's bad, yeah, that that will be a more telling tale. Yeah, I mean, uh, for, for well, what I think that this does, there's just so many pros and cons, you know. But what I, yeah, it helps the the promotions outside uh, if they still want to stay in business with the MMA. It just sucks because. A lot of sponsors, a lot of coaches. Yeah, it sucks because you know they won't. There's there's no way even if they went to Bellator or the World Series of Fighting that they'd make as much money with them that they would with the UFC. But at the same time, you think about it, the the UFC started taxing certain sponsors, and so they lost a few, uh, quite a few that didn't want to pay the, ta- uh, the taxes. You know, um, so I mean, it, it's just so many pros and cons for fighters. For uh, and it's just more so for the fighters because I think a lot of people lose out, coaches and 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 sponsor sponsoring companies and alike, you know. And so yeah, I mean, while fighters can go into uh, you know, fighters can go into the UFC now without having to worry too much about money. There are some that already are going to make a good amount of money going into the UFC, and then starting off, unless they get a good contract, aren't going to have that. They're not going to, you know, they might make less money just by going into the UFC and losing out on some sponsors, even though they can still be sponsored by them. They just cannot wear the sponsor into the cage. Uh, and there's, there's no more banners. Those are good. Those are going to be gone. Uh, come international fight week in July, first week of July. And so, um, and the only real fair thing as well here is that, you know, the fighters will get to modify their, their so-called uniforms, which are the shorts. They're going to be able to wear, um, you know, they're going to be able to modify them to whatever color, maybe put a design on there. I don't know to what extent the, the, the freedom they have on that is, but, um, at least we know that. And I hope that to, to, to some extent, there that, that that there's a lot of creativity involved because there there always was that. I mean, there, you've seen guys like Anderson Silva or Chuck Liddell and B.J. Penn, 
Mirko Krokop, these guys that have, you know, these modified kind of uh, shorts where it fits kind of them, you know, it's, it's kind of kind of kill a little bit of personality uh, a little bit uh, to some extent um, when you see, uh, the, depending on what the freedom or lack of that there is for these uh, uniforms. So it's hard. It is a wait and see kind of deal. Um, personally, I think overall it's a, it's a negative deal for, for everyone involved. Uh, the UFC, maybe. I mean, they say that they're not making the money. They say that all the money goes to, um, to the fighters. And yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, right? I mean, why, no, why would, why would you get into the business with them if you're not gonna make some money off of it, right? Yeah, they say it's all for the fighters, but I mean, I'm assuming Reebok also has to pay a sponsor tax. They have to pay for being the a partner of the UFC. I'm sure their UFC is not making the money off certain monies off them being sponsored or sales and such which is also another weird thing the the sales of like the clothing i think 20 percent of sales are going to the fighters if someone buys their specific uniform form i guess you could say a lot of people are going to buy like ronda rousey's uniform anderson silva's but there's guys that a lot of people may not know about that are like highly ranked guys maybe like a dennis bermuda someone like that that People aren't really gonna buy his uniform. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that—that's only really helping the big name fighters who people are gonna go crazy and buy their stuff. Like a lot of these small name fighters, that's not helping them either. And the UFC—I I wonder how this is gonna affect. Is it just gonna be Reebok inside the cage for them, or is that gonna affect that? I'm not. Yeah, sure. like, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean they're gonna drop Harley Davidson? Does that mean they're gonna drop I, uh, a Zions? Does that mean they're I gonna drop? It. Bud Light, you know, because they have all those That's sponsors in the cage, you know what I mean? Doubt you doubt yeah, it? Yeah, I think they're more so just putting this to the fighters than themselves, which I think isn't really fair. I think they're still giving themselves to if it if they still have all these sponsors, which I'm sure they do. They're giving themselves opportunities well, to go out and get a sponsor, but not to the fighters. You may see that as not fair, but it's not like the NFL or the NBA or I mean, because the NFL sponsored by like you know a certain tire brand and a photo brand, and like I believe one business is sponsored by like like you know how Bellator is sponsored by Dave and Buster's. You know what I mean? They're sponsored by a bunch of people, so I, I don't think that's unfair in a sense because all sporting promotions do that. Outs any sport, whether it's basketball, baseball. So and that's why I think that that will probably stay. I think Bud Light, Harley Davidson, those yeah. huge sponsors of theirs will probably stay uh, stay for them and only for the UFC, which sucks because you think about like Donald Cerrone might lose out on some Budweiser deals. You know? <laughs> um, but that's just uh, – so, I, I mean I'm, it just sucks in terms of regulation of – it, it kind of makes – it takes away a little bit of uniqueness of the sport and this has always been a unique sport. Yeah, and, and if anybody's seen this, this – the, the initial – uh, interview where Dana White made the announcement and then did an immediate interview with Ariel Hawani. He said, "This is one of those things where we're going to work towards being a, a you know a, a global sport. You know, it's one of the main things they've been working towards by you know having promotion or having sh outside of the uh, outside of the U.S. and and outside of North America and South America and going to Europe and, and Asia and." Um, and and he, yeah, I mean, they say that by doing this, they're trying to make themselves more like the NFL and the NBA and stuff like that. And so yeah, they are giving away that certain uniqueness about them, where these fighters can 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 be like you know can can basically go in there with their own personality, their own sponsors, their own set of 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 of, of kind of unspoken skin of who they are. You know what I mean? Um, and so they lose out on that and. Uh, there's just a and more of this is just more it's not like a moral thing but for them to lose on out on these sponsors putting them inside of the cage i just feel like you know whether or not they go in there with the sponsors i think that that makes a huge difference for for the sponsor sponsoring the fighter because they might decide okay if we can't be in the cage you know we don't plus also think about this that i just thought about even if they sponsor the fighter Will they still get taxed by the UFC regardless of not being inside of the cage? No, I don't um, think. They I don't should. think that they should. I, I don't, don't think, think that they would. They, logically, I don't think they should. Will they? I, think, I don't think they can do that though. Yeah, that I mean that it doesn't make sense, but uh, to do that. But what if they do? Then a lot of fighters are going to lose sponsors. I don't think they can do it though. I don't. I think it's 
they're not sponsoring. That's outside of the cage. I don't think that they have any regulation over that. I don't think they're really allowed to tax due to that. Yeah. That would make it sense. Yeah. I definitely think we should look up on that for sure, though, just yeah, to be no, sure. I don't think I don't think it's I don't think they can do it. That's the thing, and I think it just it basically just comes down to time. I know a lot of fans don't like the whole Reebok thing, and maybe maybe a lot of fighters don't like it now. But I think we just have to wait and see. It's basically it's for the fighters, and we have to see what they say after a while, and we have to take from the top guys to the guys at the bottom and everywhere in between, to see what the consensus is. And then we can really come back and discuss this because we don't know yet if it's going to work for them or if it's not going to work. We have to just wait and see. That's all we have to do. guess that's what we'll do. In the meantime, we'll, I'll, you know, definitely we'll try to look up more on this uh, issue. Um, there are a lot of pros and cons, so many so that it's hard to see if it really is a pro or a con for in general for the for everybody. So, with that being said, we'll move right along. Uh, we'll, we'll start uh, ending this off with uh, fan questions that we got from uh, the MMA Discussion uh, Facebook page. Um, again, th- uh, thanks for all your guys' opinions. I mean, it's definitely a hard topic to talk about only because, you know, it's right now we just don't know. We're kind of in the blue with details and everything of, of what there is, what there is to speak about of it thus far until we learn more. Um, and we'll definitely try and keep you guys updated uh, on the next podcast or on the Facebook page um, or on sportsofanarchy.com. So with that, we'll move on to the fan questions. Um, you guys ready to answer some questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Katana, are you still even on? <laughs> I just said ready at the same time. Oh, uh, okay. Well, we'll go to the first one. Ashley Hernandez, with the last month of 2014 coming up and uh, coming to a close, and this year coming to a close, what would you say is your most memorable moment of 2014? Mr. Katana, I'll let you go first. I feel like I'm answering this for the second time. Right? Maybe you are. Shut up. <laughs> Answer the question. <laughs> the two things I remember is Matt Brown versus Eric Silva and Dong Young Kim with the spinning dong bow. Against- <laughs> <laughs> the spinning dong bow. Spinning dong bow. Oh, my doom. God. And the dong bong a doom. Dong bong. Dong bong. <laughs> oh, Jesus. All right, go ahead. <laughs> well, for any fans that don't remember, what he's referring to is the fight between John Hathaway and Dong Young Kim where he landed the, the dong bow, as he would call it. <laughs> Definitely one of the highlight knockouts of the year, for sure. And... Uh, boy, I think when we kind of knock out of the year, we're going to have our hands full when it comes to the podcast deciding the of the year awards. That's definitely a memorable one. Um, any others, or would that be it? Uh, for me in 2014, like, you know, just to keep the list short so it actually means something, that'd be it. All right. Mm, uh, Chris, what would, you be, what would be your favorite memorable moment of 2000, or 2014? 20,000, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think I, I have to go with Dominic Cruz's return. I mean, there's nothing more special than that. The guy came back after about three years being on the shelf. He tore his ACL twice. He tore his groin. And no one even knew if he'd be able to fight again. And he came back against a top-ranked guy in Takei Mizugaki and just made easy work of him. It was like, it was like he was fighting a guy who wasn't a fighter. He didn't get hit once, I don't believe. He <laughs> He just made him look, he finished him in about a minute, and Dominic Cruz wasn't known for being a finisher. He came back looking better than ever, and he was able to finish the guy in, in pretty brutal fashion in about a minute, and just looked better. He just looked insanely good, and it was such an, it was such an overwhelmingly good feeling to see the guy come back like that, because you got to feel for a guy who's been out for that long. He was a champion. He never lost his belt, and he... He just he tried to come back so many times. He had fights booked and just kept getting injured. And then he comes back like that. you got to really just feel great for that guy. And I think he should be fighting TJ Dillashaw next, try to get his title back. And I think he's going to get it done. The guy looks unstoppable, and I think he might be. Well, that is a good one, definitely. Dominic Cruz coming back at UFC 178, I believe. Um Man, that was, yeah, that was one of the mo- that was one of the better performances we've seen in the year. But that's the key word for me for my memorable moment of 2014 uh, as far as performance goes. I think um, my favorite moment thus far of 2014. I, I um, 
minor memorable moment for me, like underneath my favorite, would be Anthony Johnson returning to the UFC. I'm a huge Anthony Johnson fan. Um, as, I, as I will say now, though, the best m moment of 2014 for me was seeing the performance of a lifetime with TJ Dillashaw when he fought Hennon Barrow at UFC uh, 173, I believe. And to me, it was just one of the best performances I have ever seen inside of a, of a in, in a fight, like in a cage, ring, what have you. It was just one of those, it was one of the best among the best. Um, it's hard to say the best because there have been so many great fights along the ages. Uh, that's among them. It's one of the best. I mean, the, the, he, the, his footwork, he just took such a huge leap and improvement and evolution in his game that he came to that fight and was just ready. Hennon Burrell, at the time, going into that fight, a killer, a guy just spinning back, kicking people in the face, you know, putting people down, destroying Uriah Faber, beating him twice. You know, I mean, and and everybody had him as the favorite against Cruz going in. I wouldn't, I don't know what you'd say now, but for that fight, I mean, it was just seemed like, and then and then TJ wasn't even supposed to be in that fight. The first initial matchup was Rafael Sunsa, and then he gets injured, and so a month before they put DJ in, and he and he came in there ready. He went in there, his footwork looked magical. His his hands were just on point and perfect and precise. His uh, head movement couldn't have looked any better. Uh, he wrestled when he needed to wrestle, and that's the thing too. Is he mixed it up so well? Whenever Hennon thought that at some point he'd initiate a wrestling uh, game, he, he kept striking, kept popping him, dropped him in the first round, and then just tore it up until round five and finished it. It was just, it was, it was a, just thinking about it now, man. I, I just want to watch it again. It was such a great fight. Uh, my favorite moment of 2014, and I, I just and for him and for him and Dominic Cruz to be the fight next coming up in 2015. Man, I can't wait. I mean, that fight is going to be insane. I mean, that's a who, who who knows kind of fight, you know. I mean, Dominic Cruz coming back strong, TJ Dillashaw making this his year. Oh man, it makes for such a great fight next year. It's be a fun one to break oh down. man, I can't handle it. I can't. It's going to be awesome to break down for sure. Oh, for sure. Oh, so sad. We're going to be talking about that for a good half hour when that fight yeah, comes down. For, oh, sure. yeah, for sure. What did you say, Mr. Katana? <laughs> I'm just so sad thinking about TJ beating Burrell. Oh, yeah, you're a big Burrell fan. That's great. <laughs> I, I personally think it was a fix to try to. <laughs> 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 All right, next question, Mr. You, you silly bastard. All right, anyway. <laughs> um, we're getting kind of the opposite question here from um, um, Rodrigo Ortega. Asking us, oh, this is, yeah, an opposite kind of question. Asking us what what fight or changes in the MMA world are you uh, looking for, forward to in the year 2015? Chris, I'll let you go first. All right, it's definitely not the Reebok uniforms. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, I feel like we've answered a similar question to this a few, like a, maybe last podcast. I know we answered something similar, just what fights we're looking forward to. And this actually, is a kind of a broader, or, or like a yeah, like a more a wider broader, range. But I'm just, in terms of that, I'll just stick to what I said last. I'll make it a little short and sweet. Um, Anderson Silva versus Nick Diaz, because I just can't wait to. Anderson Silva is one of my favorite. He's probably my favorite fighter of all time, and I just can't wait to see him come back. I hope he comes back well and just looks like it was all himself. And that's gonna be just a fun fight. It's gonna be fun to watch. And then um. Another fight I'm really looking forward to is John Jones versus Daniel Cormier. Because these guys, this is basically a super fight when you look at it. Daniel Cormier probably could have been heavyweight champion or he could have fought for the heavyweight title. He's one of the best guys in the division. And he's undefeated. He was a former Strike Force heavyweight tournament champion. He's undefeated. He's one of the best guys in the world. And then we have John Jones, who's the consensus, basically the consensus number one guy in the universe. So In the universe. <laughs> Basically, so we gotta see these guys. He's a Power Ranger. <laughs> these guys fight and they don't like each other, as everyone knows. They uh, don't yeah. like each other. That makes it even more interesting. And I, that's a tough fight for both of them. I just want to see who comes out on top. That should be a fun one as well. No, it's definitely gonna be one kick ass of a main event for sure. Um, I mean, real quick, Chris, who you mean that? Um, that's such a tough one. I think Cormier has a really good shot, but I'm gonna go with Jones. Yeah, when the time comes, we'll discuss it further. I got John Jones, though. Uh, Mr. Katana, be the tiebreaker. 
No, I got Daniel Cormier. Oh, ha, 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 ha. I know Jonas does too, so I feel like I'm the only one in there. I don't want John Jones to win. I would love to see Daniel Cormier get it done. Um, personally, I think that John Jones is going to be prepared. But uh, we'll see. So, I mean, as our heart's in on all four of us getting DC the win, but we'll see what happens when the time comes. Uh, Mr. Katana, what are you looking forward to in the year 2015? Um, within the year 2015 or just future? Just The year 2015, that's the question. Like any possible fight that you could see in 2015 or fights that's already scheduled for 2015? Within 2015, I am that, – that hasn't been mentioned. I mean I'm really looking forward to the fights that Chris mentioned. But what hasn't been mentioned, really looking forward to Gustafson versus Johnson. Woo! Um, <laughs> I think that that really sets up a beautiful fight for either, I mean, DC versus Gustafson or Johnson or John Jones versus Gustafson or Johnson. I'd really like to see the Jones-Gustafson rematch, but what, any way you spin it, it's going to be an awesome fight. I, I personally have Rumble Johnson beat Gustafson, but I wouldn't be surprised if Gustafson pulled it off, but I'm back in Rumble all the way. Rumble. All right. For mine. Time is now. Say that again. Hashtag rumble. The time is now. <laughs> the time is now <laughs> for Rumble Johnson. Okay, two answers for me in the tide, and there's a reason why. Uh, because it's very hard. It's a tug of war. First of all, UFC 184 will be going down in the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California. I am in LA. I live here. I love it here. And I've been waiting for a show like this to come. And man, 184, five fights in already. It looks stacked. Chris Weidman versus Vitor Belfort, Ronda Rousey versus uh, Kat Zingano, uh, Bigfoot Silver versus Frank Mir, Jacare Souza versus Yo Romero. I mean, those fights alone are just have me sold. So when they start, oh, Josh Koscheck versus Jake Ellenberger. I mean, this this card's gonna be sick, and I could not be happier that it is gonna happen here in LA, and I am gonna attend it. Definitely. Once tickets are on sale, I'm getting mine. And so I cannot wait for that. That's that's definitely what I'm looking most forward to in the year 2015. Next to that, as far as fighters go, um, I am going I am looking forward to the year of the 25th hashtag rum, 2015 year of the rumble. That's me. Spread it. I'm going to be hashtagging it all over the place. Anthony Rumble Johnson is one of my favorite fighters in the game right now. It has been for the last six years. Um, and I can't. And now it, I feel like this is this is going to be his year. I feel like he's going to beat Alexander Zverev, whether it's DC or Jones that gets the title. He's going to fight them for the title. And he's going to win that belt. He's going to shock the world next year. And that's what I can't wait for the year 2015. Damn, getting me all emotional and stuff. <laughs> Man, I think we'll cut it off there. I mean, because there's no better way to cut off than than, uh, than with those answers right there. We've had an awesome podcast going through the card that's going to happen this weekend, UFC 181. It's a can't-miss card. I think it's one of the best pay-per-views on paper that we've seen all year. Um, Mr. Katana, anything to add to, to what your favorite fight is you can't wait to see on that card? Um, on this uh, – I'm sorry, on which card? On UFC 181 this weekend. On UFC 181 this weekend, I believe that I am actually looking forward most towards uh, Anthony versus Gilbert simply because I believe Melendez is going to win, and I can't wait till me and Jonas are right about this. You guys are wrong, so, you know, go after yourselves. We shall see. Chris, same question. All right, obviously the two title fights are up there. I mean, I'm looking forward to both of them, but I'm also really looking forward to Abel Trujillo versus Tony Ferguson. That should be a real fun one. That should probably that that should be that could be fight of the night. That and the the top two cards are all in running for fight of the night. I would say those three. Um, I gotta say the same. I gotta say Abel Trujillo versus. Uh, I can't. Uh, you know, once the pay per view starts, Abel Trujillo versus Tony Ferguson. That's gonna be the fight to watch. After that, uh, yeah, Hendrick Slaughter. Can't wait. I think Pettis is just gonna starch Melinda. Sorry, Penner Mana. Whatever. You guys are going down. I'm sorry. It's gonna happen. Fight fans. Thanks for listening to us. We try to keep it short, and here we have it. Um, we cannot wait to get back. Once UFC 181 has ended, you will hear from us again uh, on uh, the next podcast. We uh, like to thank our sponsors, SubmissionFC.com and MMAProfit.com. Please go visit the, the site sponsoring this podcast and, uh, M- or SportsOfAnarchy.com. Please visit our Facebook page, uh, MMA Discussion. We're trying to build it back up. In the meantime, that we see if we can get the old one back. If we can't, please 
please go back and and uh, give us a like and you know join the page and we're all there. All our admins are still around. Uh, me, Zach, Chris, Jonas, um, Gary, even uh, Joel uh, is looking to return once the fan page builds up a little bit. Um, well, uh, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, please do at Nick the Phantom. That's my Twitter handle. Chris' Twitter handle is at Chris Pal Yuka. Yeah, and also uh, follow us at Sports of Anarchy on Twitter. And uh, guys, make sure to watch the uh, listen to the podcast. We're now on Stitcher. Recently, just got on there, and just out of a few days ago, we're also on iTunes. So make sure to check us out on both of those. And on iTunes, there is MMA discussions. We are discussion without the S, just to make that clear. Uh, give us a review on there. Give us a thumbs up on Stitcher if you guys enjoy what you're listening to. If you guys enjoy us, please, iTunes, we're on there. Subscribe. If you guys are on Stitcher, please subscribe. If you guys are listening to us from either one of those two systems, you rock. If you guys are listening to us on YouTube, you guys rock. If you're listening to us yeah. at all, you guys are awesome. Yeah, Thank you guys. Let for us know what you think. Give us some feedback. We'd love to hear from you guys. We would love to hear from you. Please, if there's a comment section below from whatever you're listening to, give us a give us a question. Give us something you'd like to hear us add onto the podcast. If not, any any critique on us is well is is well welcomed for sure. Uh, we're sign after that. We're signing off. Thank you guys for listening. Chris Katana, say goodbye. Thank you very much for having me, guys, and see you next time. Next time, definitely. Thanks for listening.